Hey yo, May here. Welcome back to This Side of the World. Today we have three exciting new friends and guests joining me to go on tangents about photography. If you aren't familiar with Photography with Friends, this is a podcast where I feature photographers, photo hobbyist friends, and we just geek out on everything photography related. We also talk about the perils of life and whatever that leads us to. So welcome. I hope you enjoy this new set of ramblings. Thanks for listening. Before I start, I just want to mention if you're interested in trying Dehancer, it's a great plugin. So you can use it for Photoshop, Premiere, Lightroom, and DaVinci. So what it does helps to create that nice film look to your photos or your videos. You gotta check it out, it's pretty cool. And you can get 10% off all products using my promo code MAYSHOOTS, all caps. So please do try it out. And now on to the podcast. Thank you for joining me on this gorgeous sunny day indoors. One of our fellow <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> friends. My camera here. <laughs> As a, very <laughs> one of our fellow uh, photographers has ran to grab or the camera like a true photographer is and yeah so joining me today we have three lovely friends luna shavi hey hello um, wang hi and steven vanakam <laughs> i'm sure this will go better <laughs> only wang out for you. yeah <laughs> okay so Luna is a versatile hobbyist photographer who has an eye for details, whether it be texture of a bird's wings or the window structure of a building. She takes her time to capture the beautiful world around us. Yi is an avid, loyal, like a lover, not sponsored, but could be, whom likes to geek out on quality lenses and always tries to find the best gear to express his love for his cat through the glass. And Steven often shoots TFP portraits. He enjoys discovering new subjects to shoot, and his drive to learn new things shine through with his curiosity to ask questions. So welcome, everyone, Luna, E, and Steven, to Photography with Friends. Thank, Thank you. For having us. Thank you for the invitation. No problem. Thanks for coming over. And we just had some snacks, talked a little bit. Um, so I just want to say first off, how are you guys feeling mentally, spiritually? How's it going? I am a little bit nervous. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. This is my first podcast. Again, we've been speaking for like, what, two hours before the podcast began? Yep. Mm -hmm. And now as soon as you put the limelight on us, yep. um, it's kind of reading away from it. But again, <laughs> it's like after five or ten minutes, we'll mm -hmm. be back. Yeah, it's like the camera, right? If you're shooting a model or someone who's not comfortable in front of the camera, they tense up kind of thing. Yeah. It takes it takes time to you get used to the idea of someone else listening. Mm -hmm. Right to what we to what we say, what Yeah. But yeah, it's it's been pretty good. After a long weekend, uh, sorry, a long winter. Mm. We're finally getting some spring, so it's bright. Yeah. Finally able to see the asphalt again. Yes. Right. Yeah, you can see the beautiful brown grass. And... Yeah, in Calgary, uh, not a lot of plows come over and pick up the snow because it's privatized. So when it snows, two weeks later, it's still on the ground. Mm -hmm. Very different from back in Toronto where they snow, immediately it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Same, Same in Ottawa. Montreal. Yeah. Same sure. in Ottawa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little different in Calgary seeing snow all the time like on the ground and, yeah, and now it feels like a bit more spring coming over less snow mm -hmm. it's warming up we're starting to plan spring shootings and mm -hmm. ideas for when the grass is greener mm -hmm. yeah I think that's yeah lots of ideas yeah mm -hmm. you how are you feeling not really good <laughs> well, well we just had a lot of snacks mm -hmm. some drinks some oranges some geopolitics. Some <laughs> geopolitics. Yeah. Well, we've got to have that in conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're doing good. This is how we know you're getting old. <laughs> you start talking about politics? Yeah. Yes. I'm, actually, yes. I'm actually caring about it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, actually caring would be a strong word, but... <laughs> Curious. Curious. Like discussing yeah. like adults do. Yeah. Well. Oh, my God. oh no. When did that happen? 
I think it happened 12 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I Means you're an old man then. We, I refuse to think about it. <laughs> we have photography to keep us young. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of photography, how's everyone's photography going? Mm, pretty good. Yeah. When was the last time you guys had a shoot? Last um, last week, right? Last week. Yeah. Last uh, Saturday, I want to say. I saw besides group photo shoots, like when did you guys do individual shoots? Oh, I took photos of my cat yesterday. <laughs> I definitely have not been yeah. one totally comes yet. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, mate? Uh, maybe like two days ago or even, yes, was it yesterday? No, two days ago. I was downtown just like trying to finish up a roll because I'm doing a video on developing with coffee. So it's just trying to finish that roll up so I can start developing that. Yeah. So are you doing videos for Instagram or are you just trying to learn so much like videography? Um, so I'm doing the for YouTube. So I'm just doing, I was taking photos on my film camera and I was finishing the roll. Then I'm going to come home. I was going to come home and develop it, make a video out of that, the whole process of the, developing the film. You do both video mm -hmm. and film, sorry, digital and film. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And you just recently bought a new camera? Yes. I got the A7C Sony. And... <laughs> <laughs> Is it easier switching to digital from film or? Um, I mean, I shot digital. Oh, digital. Digital from film. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But when they do work out, it's like super satisfying. It overrides the negatives of okay. that. Yeah. I had a film camera when I was, I can't remember how old. That was probably in like elementary, junior high. Mm -hmm. It was a point and shoot. It was a Fuji film, I'm pretty sure. Because my dad, it was a. It yeah. was big at the time. Mine too was. Yeah. But I don't even know. I don't can't even remember why I stopped. Maybe just like I wasn't really in it for the photography. I was more because I was taking pictures of buses on the street. And I think after taking so many photos of buses, because it cost money to develop the film. So after mm -hmm. developing so many. Oh, yeah. The other thing yeah. I was expecting. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I was a kid, so after right. developing so many pictures of buses, maybe maybe one day my family just says, you know what, no more buses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no more films. and Because and, I don't even remember what happened to the camera, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I still have the camera. Okay. Yeah. Maybe your family oh, still have it. Because I definitely don't have the camera myself. I have no idea what happened to it. Yeah. 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 Usually, like your your grandparents or your family members would keep it somewhere. It wasn't it wasn't like one of those old cameras that you would pass the pass it no, down no. to? Because it was it was the start of consumer electronic grade yeah. cameras. Yeah, it was. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It was a point and shoot. It's like mm -hmm. you don't even need to know anything to use it. You mm -hmm. just you need to know how to load the film. You mm -hmm. need to know how to turn it on. You need to know where the shutter is. Yeah, and that's it. And that's yeah, choose the batteries. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I definitely did not know a thing. About it. I have had zero experience with film, so I'm just sitting around listening to mm -hmm. all the hard work that goes into it. Because it's digital, you shoot, you look at the camera, the display on the camera to see if the photo looks good, the composition. Yeah. And then you put it on the big screen, you see that it's out of focus, especially if you use a smaller desktop. Mm -hmm. That's what happened with my most recent photo shoot. Mm -hmm. So I gave my Sony a 7 IV for service because I was too stupid when I was changing lenses. I didn't hold my camera sensor down. Mm -hmm. So some of the snowflakes hit the sensor. Mm -hmm. And I, the next day when I was taking photos of the sky, there was a lot of one second. Sorry, but interrupted by little kids wanting to clean windows for money. <laughs> George, Steven, what were you saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I give my... To service? My Sony mm -hmm. so went for to service because I had a shoot with uh, my friends, present company included, uh, at Canmore. And it was snowing that day. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to try doing some landscape after several months. So... I tried the 85 millimeter. It was too narrow, so I decided to try something wide, a 35. So when I changed the lenses, I did not hold my camera sensor down. I had it fixed on a tripod, and I just removed the lens, the 85, and I plugged in a 35. But in between those few seconds, a handful of snowflakes fell onto the sensor. I didn't really think a big deal of that. Mm -hmm. until the next day when I took photos of the sky and I noticed that there were a lot of spots on the sky. Mm -hmm. So I went to the camera store, which is where I purchased a camera store in Calgary, shout out. <laughs> uh, went there and they suggested that I send it to Sony uh, just to make sure there's no water damage on the sensor. And it took them three weeks to get back to me mm -hmm. saying that, hey, they didn't specify any water damage, but they did say that to clean the sensor, it would cost about $90. Mm -hmm. I was like, I mean, the whole sensor cleaning set is about $40 mm -hmm. and it'll take me two minutes to do it. Yep. So I was like, nah, mm -hmm. I'll do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I asked them and the camera should be returning in the next two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had my A7 IV for four weeks now. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I didn't want to stop doing any shoots, so I had a couple of portrait sessions with my old Canon T7i, mm -hmm. uh, which is not as sophisticated as the A7 IV, but hey, it still gets the job done. And I got a publication out of the A7, the oh. shoot from the T7i that I did. Congrats. Thank you. Um, so the most recent shoot that I had on Thursday, the shoot went relatively well. It could have gone so much better if I had all the inspirational photos that I had with me because I downloaded all the inspiration, all of the photos for the inspiration for the shoot on my phone and I left the phone, the old phone at mm. home. So I had to improvise. Mm. But some of the photos turned really well, but most of the photos were out of focus mm. because I was using a 1.8. Uh, but again, I didn't notice that 
they were a bit out of focus because mm. I was looking at the photos from the smaller screen on the display on the yeah. camera. Mm. Uh, I didn't know that the photos that I really, really liked were a touch out of focus mm. until I saw it on the big screen. So again, with the digital, I can click as many photos as I want. And even if, let's say, only 10% of them are in focus, I'd still have a good chunk of them. Mm -hmm. But if you use a film, yeah. Yeah. I Cam like a film camera can hold only yep. so many films mm -hmm. and you have to be really careful yep. and if you miss that then it's just a waste of time and money for yeah. both you mm -hmm. and both the model yeah so how do you do, do you have any such experience with film um i did a family shoot one time um they actually really like my film stuff so they're like oh i want you to do a film shoot with my family so it was uh, his wife and two kids. So the kids are pretty young. One's a baby and one's about like three, four years old. Um, so their mom, I was very honest about like my experience with film. So I was like, okay, I did a couple of portraits, but not like just for fun with friends. But I never actually did a portrait session with a group with film before. So this would be the first time. So. You have to know that not all the photos will come out. Maybe none of them will come out. This is just the thing. And then he agreed to it, and I gave them like a discount from that. And then mom came back and said, um, the wife came back and said, hey, maybe just be safe. Let's do digital as well. It's like, okay, yeah, I'll do that, and then I'll do a set package for you. So I went to the shoot, did this, did this shooting. It was like right outside their backyard. They had a big tree. The lighting was okay, not super bright, um, and did the shoot, it was fun. Was it outdoors? It was outdoors, like in the backyard. Um, so there's a little bit of shade, not, not a huge amount of light. I wish I had like a flash, it would have been like a lot better, because the film I was using had lower ISO. Um, so a lot of the shots end up being out of focus. Mm. Because I had to go lower in shutter speed, and I was sh ended yeah. up shaking a lot more. Yeah so, okay. yeah, so the digital, most some of the digital came out okay, and then you know all the film was just like too dark, too shaky, and I told them I'm sorry, like this didn't work out, and I'm not gonna charge you for that. And they're like, okay, that's fine. They liked some of the digital, so they'll they'll go with that one. And then that's just my experience. Like some people are really professional, they'll actually only shoot weddings in film right i don't understand how they do it but they must have like really you know set in mind on knowing their camera knowing their film and just like working through it through experience and knowing what's right because it's very risky it's much more risky than like digital so do you see at that <laughs> point it just becomes muscle memory um i say so like I think it's just over experience, you know, it's muscle. Experience. I think you have to be, learning. you have to be very consistent at it, right? Because um, even for, I use a rangefinder. So even for a rangefinder, what happens is when you focus the rangefinder, you have a patch in the middle of the frame. That's where you adjust your focus. So with a really um, fast lens, because you have to constantly focus and recompose, you have to know how much you have to miss the focus in the middle. So when you shift your camera, when you tilt your camera and your, fo uh, and your focal plane changes, so like for example, your eyes are in focus. So you can't, you can't dial in the fo focus completely in the middle of the frame because when you tilt that camera, it'll, your eyes will go out of focus, right? So it, com it was basically developing muscle memory. I get good at it if I'm using the camera every day, trying to take mm -hmm. the same photo, and then like yeah. I'll put the camera down for a week, and then I don't know what I'm doing anymore, mm -hmm. and then I have to kind of go through that same process. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. we have eye autofocus for film as well. Eye autofocus? I don't think that's the thing. Mm -hmm. no, no, because it's, uh, that's automatic. Then there is like you have light meters that yeah. will give you in terms of exposure and like manual focus film cameras will have like you know kind of like show you the focus change yeah there are focus <laughs> aids there are auto focus but i auto focus comes from machine learning right so you mm -hmm. have to your camera would have some kind of ai model built in mm -hmm. okay so you can't do machine learning without a computer on board yeah so you have to use your naked eye to make sure it is in focus so what you want is in focus 
is in focus, basically. Yeah. So yeah. I guess there's a reason why I don't use film because I don't have that patience. <laughs> I mean, I can spend quite a bit of money to get that eye out of focus so yeah. I can save some time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, rather but, than but that's specifically like a portrait problem too, right? Like if you're just shooting landscape, for example, that kind of goes oh, away because okay. you can just yeah. use focus scale. You basically don't have to look at your focus at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of them are really powerful though, like the, the big medium format ones. Like the, the Mamiya RB67s, they're almost to the point of automatic because they're just, everything could be super sharp mm. and almost as sharp as, or even more sharper than like digital photos. When you zoom in, you see all the details. You see, you know, the bokeh and everything. It's just the softest creaminess of it. It's because the quality of the glass of the lens is just super high. And a lot of digital cameras, you can actually like swap out the film camera lens into the, you know, digital. Like for like, e, I think you were looking at some film camera lenses before, were you? Well, I guess technically all the lenses I have are film mm -hmm. lenses. I mean, because the, the Leica M hasn't really changed since the 50s, since the M3. The modern ones are the same. Like when we talk about the M10 that was released in I think 2017, it even went back to the old dimensions of the uh, the film M. So same mount. Mm -hmm. It's actually probably one of the oldest mounts out there that are still having like new lenses being produced. Mm -hmm. So you you're still using the lens um, the rangefinder mechanism to focus unless you use live view. Like you can some some of the M cameras have live view too. But they're, they're essentially no difference because they still produce, Leica still produce the M6, the film camera, and you use the same lenses on that camera versus the digital M's, it's just the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go back, for example, I have some older lenses I bought from the 70s and the 90s. Um, digital M, I don't believe it would, no, digital M wasn't a thing back then, so they would have been made for film cameras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many lenses do you have? For the M, I just have four. Just, just four. four. <laughs> right. well, is that a lot? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you bought with the other one? Well, I have three bodies, and so two are like a M's. One is like a Lumix S5. Okay. Um. So for the light for the M mount, I have four lenses, and then for Lumix, I have two L mount lenses. So on average, I have two lenses per camera. So I thought it was like not that many. Okay. Uh -huh. What about you? You used to have several bodies, right? Several bodies? Yeah. Of digital like, or film? I just in general. In general? Oh, I have like 20 film cameras. And, yeah. And I have two digital now before. I'm See, a friend of mine, <laughs> a friend of mine in Germany, he's a photographer. He does weddings and stuff, right? I visited him last spring. And same same idea. <laughs> I show up and this guy has like more cameras than he's got fingers. I'm like, I don't have three cameras. That's okay, right? Like Yeah, but the thing is I don't use them all. They're yeah. just you know, a well, collection. Yeah, a lot of them don't work. A lot of these yeah. cameras at his place don't work. They're just right? paperweight. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he uses he's a Pentax guy, so he uses two Pentax cameras. That's his like bread and butter. He's got like a Fuji for fun mm. and then a whole bunch of cameras that I can't name. Yeah. So I went there for the wedding. So instead of, so he did hire photographers that are like wedding photographers that are kind of his buddies, like, cause they, they're kind of like in their group, but more pro than I think probably we are here because they actually do a lot of weddings. Um, so one of his buddies was taking like the actual wedding photos, but what he did was because of all his little point and shoot film cameras all over the place, he just basically put out a box full of them loaded with film. Any guest can just take one and start taking photos. And then he basically develops and keeps whatever you can keep afterwards yeah mm. he's a really handy guy like yeah like hats down or hats what's hats down is that hats it? off hats off hats off <laughs> Oops. hats that's, off yeah. hats not down hats <laughs> off no, you gotta take it off hats off for this guy like so, like yeah so it was um very creative person mm. but then until mm. i knew about his like family history like they do like music um his wedding like the whole um, the entire show was choreographed by like his group of friends. Like he didn't hire anybody. Mm. Like all his friends planned the whole thing. 
just a really, really talented group of people. Mm -hmm. Problem with film, right? Like, because rangefinder isn't super, like, it is very accurate if you know what you're doing, but if you're like, if you're rusty, or you, like me, you're in a pinch, you, because that day when we did the TFE with the models, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm pretty sure I had over a thousand frames. Yeah. And I ended up keeping maybe 50 of them. Mm. Like, usually that's how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, and most of them I didn't keep. It, it also kind of made my job easy because you're not even thinking far enough about, oh, do I like this composition? Do I like this photo? Like, as a, you don't even get to think that far. Just, you're like, <laughs> yeah, it's just the blurry mess that's gone, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's the same for film to that sense because you have, for example, 35 millimeter, you get 36 frames. Mm -hmm. Maybe you only like two of them. Yeah. Three of them are in focus, and the other ones there's a trash yeah. for you. I still would say that with film, mm. you are physically throwing away stuff. With digital, you just select delete. Actually, you brought up a good point because that would be my biggest. Because I, I'm super afraid of getting sentimental, right? Mm. Like yeah. I asked May before, what do you do with films? So you like throw throw them away after? I know. Yeah, exactly. Then I'm like, well, you do have storage. Though. Well, what, by the time you're like 50, you're gonna have like two trailers full of films. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, it's it's just that in digital, you have like you kind of store a lot more in a smaller space. Yeah, just right? Fly hard drive. It's just more physical, like yeah, having exactly. a photo album rather yeah. than like having everything stored in your computer. You can't like physically see it, but it's there. Or several hard drives. Yeah, at some point. That's least that's physical too. Yeah, yeah just in smaller doses. But in my mind, is you'd be spending what fifteen dollars for a film, fifteen twenty dollars for a film? Yeah, how much are they? Now it's going up, like Kodak prices going up. You can get up to like twenty five bucks for one roll. For uh, if you're doing like thirty five, it'll be like thirty six rolls or uh, thirty six shots. Or if you're doing medium format, it'll be like sixteen or ten or twelve shots. That's like almost a then, of photo. But Holy there's man. yes, there's also half frame, which is the shoot half of the quality but at least you get double More. the frames so you get 72 frames over uh, 36 half the quality how does that work um so like super it's close. a smaller camera oh uh, uh, it's a smaller camera uh, so then okay. have a less smaller oh so you like yeah. so you fit like two two pictures on one yes exactly uh, on one negative so it's, so it's yeah. like micro four thirds but for film yeah but the quality is actually not as bad as you think okay. well i mean micro four thirds <laughs> is not bad it's just yeah. it's a small sensor yeah 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 so there's ways around it mm -hmm. but definitely the issue with film right now is prices are going up and up and that's detracting a lot of people from starting film because yeah. it's just so expensive but what how i look at it is as for digital, we spend everything at once, but for film, you spend as you go. Kind of thing. And you can also be liberal with digital. You can click what thousand photos mm -hmm. in one shoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't. I don't know. I, an M six is pretty expensive, so. Huh. Yes, I, I still, but still, you know, when you go to a special place or you have a special event, mm -hmm. and it turns out that none of the photos in your films are good, mm -hmm. it's kind of. Well, the thing it's is, really sad, yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, I'm trying to be more conscious of because using digital, one of the things I realize I tend to do is I will, um, you know, purposely do things. So I know that in post process, I can salvage the photo, mm. right? Like if I'm not, I don't have the right lens, I would just uh, yeah. all crop after not no big deal, right? You right. you meter you meter to the highlight instead of the the overall picture. So with film, you actually have to think about you know what the picture what, what how you want the picture to turn out and then yep. especially especially with i suppose i mean I, I don't know how cropping works in film so maybe you want to think about that beforehand can mm -hmm. you crop in film can you like just cut the photos or what you will after you scan them you basically edit them and say where you okay. yeah, right. digital, yeah. use a crop and post okay okay mm -hmm. but but i guess if you were if if this were yesteryear mm -hmm. and you don't have that yeah you you want to make sure your 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 framing is right yeah yeah, yeah. everything is still yeah. yeah you just want to inch camera because film is a lot about yeah. getting it right in camera yeah. and so you don't have to edit too much yeah. in post because it, you lose that film quality of like oh it's you know yeah purely shot in the moment kind of thing but i think 
uh, bring that to like an efficiency in terms of like shooting so much in digital. Yeah. I think like film actually really helps with that because if you're really like thinking about your shot before taking it instead of like, you know, just like spraying spray with your pray. digital, yeah, yeah spray and pray, you like do less of that because it teaches you to be like mindful of what you're shooting. Yeah. And then when you're editing, you can don't have to go through like 10,000 photos. You can maybe just do 100 right. photos to go through because you've been careful about what you're shooting. Right. So I think that helps with mm -hmm. like from film, implementing that into a digital is like a really good thing. Yeah, because lately I, I'm trying to be more conscious of the composition to get it right instead of like cropping mm -hmm. post. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's slower. Um, I'm not saying I don't like it. I actually like it because I mean the whole the whole thing that started me, like you know, like I went through phases, but like this latest final like phase of me understanding what photography or how to take photos properly is about slowing down and doing things, taking your time. So it's not it's not bad. It's just I think I, I do it better when I'm alone. Mm. It's more like therapeutic. Mm -hmm. in a big group you're trying to oh what's everybody else doing uh, you know we have like a limited time here and i gotta keep up and mm. try to do things right so you i think to, it, you also don't, don't want to be in someone else's way yeah yeah, yeah. so 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 in that sense like I, I i tend to rush things but if i'm by myself i think that's when like that's when when i really start appreciating kind of the cameras i have because mm -hmm. let's face it like yeah like Leica like M's, whatever, like, people say things about them, like, I, 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 if you were actually, you actually need the photo, if your life depends on the photo, I would leave the Leica like M's home and bring my Lumix, and that's the camera I would use, yeah. I said two years ago, how did your photography improve from two or three years ago? Mm, that's a good question. It's probably gotten worse, because that was before... <laughs> Because that was before COVID, I probably went out more. Mm. Well, no, two years ago was still during COVID. Are we counting COVID as two years? Or yeah. Pre-COVID, let's say pre-COVID. Okay. Up to 2019. How, how, how were you in 2019 and how did you improve now? Well, for starters, I, I, now I'm using a, a mirrorless camera and the, before, like uh, even a year and a half ago, I was using a, a compact camera. That like point and shoot? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there is already a big improvement, a big improvement and, and learning experience right. Right about photography and about, uh, and about the like everything around it, including the, the equipment and mm -hmm. the maintenance and everything. Um, still, I I'm still, for example, having some some hard time uh, adapting to not having a lot of zoom mm -hmm. in one place okay. because, as I very accurately pointed out, I like details. Right, so for for example, for shooting a, a building or for shooting, I I will be used to have a pretty decent zoom right there without the need to change, like to stop everything and change everything. Mm -hmm. But also, um, uh, you know, also like for example, zoom lenses are super heavy, mm -hmm. not say expensive, but too, but. Heavy. Mm -hmm. you just have it carrying around. So I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't carry all that around, right? So, yeah. So I'm, I'm still trying to adapt to that and to learn how to work with, for example, with a, a smaller zoom lens or with a prime lens. Mm -hmm. So and how to adapt my style and my compositions to to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, I would say I've probably settled into a look that I kind of like that I just consistently go back to. In terms of composition? or anything? No, in terms of like edit, post-process and colors. And because I, I guess, I guess two, three years ago, I would probably, 
like you would think that I would show you like a set of photos you would think like three different people took them because they're all in different they're all they all look different I think now I've settled into the more muted or matte look of, of like I don't actually like HDR looks because I think it's um I think it's it's more to me it's more abstract to have like a matte look than than um like super like hyper realistic HDR or whatnot like I figured I figured if if you want to make it like an art and your own interpretation you kind of have to put your own spin to it no. um like a lot of the looks are kind of fads right they will fade over time but when you look at like photos from 50 60 70 100 years ago um i actually like the old school look with the slightly muted colors and not as punchy the blacks are more like dark grays i don't know i kind of dig that look and maybe that's just me like because i like i like more monochrome i like monochrome yeah i like black i love black and white um and um i don't know it's like everything else i kind of like to i'm like amish right like <laughs> no like no, there's like no like do i want to live without technology completely fuck no but there's like a sweet spot where i don't really want more from there right so mm -hmm. so it's like this almost you know um is it like Mennonites? I don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, like in between. It, it's almost like um, a a a um, a self contradiction. Mm. I, I want the tactile. I want the dials, the buttons, and the you know mm -hmm. the rangefinder. But but I want my camera to be digital too, so I don't have to deal with you know like messing up film and all that stuff. And I can look at it on my computer. So I don't know. So that's that's really I'm kind of stuck in between like that. Yeah. Mm. What about you, man? Hmm. I guess a lot of my photos are more in focus now compared yeah. to like a couple of years ago. <laughs> Everything was just. That's good. I was like, oh, this is pretty good. And I look back at it now, I'm like, this was not in focus. Why did I like this photo? It's like all my tastes in like terms of what is good to me has changed over the years and be like, I'm a little more critical with my work and more aware of like what the look I need want this to look like and what looks good um i think that goes over through experience mm -hmm. and just like shooting so much and going out and then seeing other people's photos too and being like not comparing but just you know seeing yeah learning from others seeing the differences and be like okay i could have done this better this better and now it doesn't look as great as i thought it would as it did yeah um so i think that's a good thing that you know learning through the process and yeah. that's there are a lot of talented people like every time mm -hmm. i look at the photos people we shoot with they share their photos on instagram like, holy crap yeah like, i wish i can take photos like that man yeah in our group there's a lot of talented people and everyone sees what like we all go to the same location but we all shoot something completely differently yeah different angles different you know colors and the presets styles. and styles Everything. and yeah it's just like really nice to see all the yes all the artistry and all, all of your nice orange <laughs> sunsets and you look at mine and you're like oh where's the colors <laughs> Heaven. You did black and white. yeah very amish of you <laughs> sorry camera doesn't do color either and sometimes you feel you look at some photos and say oh my god i was right there why didn't i think of that yeah exactly. yeah and sometimes you'd be like oh i want to try that too and then you do it and you're like why does that my look like that yeah. <laughs> maybe just yeah. their hand in the art like they put their soul into whatever they're shooting they're able to make it work but maybe for you you can just you know go somewhere else and try something different yeah yeah and yeah. it's also like a, as any other trade or art mm. it's about practice yeah yeah right so if you have an image in your head which i think we all we most of the photograph or pictures we take start like an image in our head right mm -hmm. so if you have an image in your head and you don't get it at the first well, you just continue trying and practicing more and more mm -hmm. until you learn how to do it, mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, in, in the group we have, there are some very experienced people yeah. who are always willing to explain things and to help. Yeah. So that that's also very nice. 
And you said you were being conscious about using the uh, taking your time with the composition and stuff. So was that mm -hmm. with film or now that you have your digital, mm -hmm. are you gonna just spray and pray? <laughs> No, I never spray and pray unless it's like a, you know, wedding shoot or something. I need to capture moments. Then I think I would need to, because I do everything manual. I, I shoot manually all the time. And then now I have to think, consider time and group shots. They don't have time for me to, you know, be yeah. fiddling with the manual and like, just wait like five more minutes, stand still. But I just have to do automatic and just, you know, shoot like 10 photos, hopefully some of them you know, work because just have to capture, you know, the moment they don't care about the artistry in that point. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, a lot of event photography is like that too. It's just like, they just want you to take the moment. They don't care about the artistry in that sense or creativity. Yeah. You have to kind of set that aside a little bit. And yeah, I come to learn that as well. It's it's also, um, I don't know what happens, but you have one model with a lot of photographers, like with the, with the library event. Mm. We went, for example, yeah, or like fifty photographers or something. Yeah, yeah so more than fifty. It was, it was, it was crazy. Super mm. interesting, super yeah. interesting. But yeah, so sometimes you don't like to just end up shooting a lot mm. because in that moment you don't have time. Mm. You know to stop everything because every like it's fifty other people there. You can't stop it. But yeah. that, that also happens <laughs> when when you shoot, for example, stage. A stage events or mm, like dance photography. Like dance photography. Yeah. I do a little of, I do a little of dance or performance photography. And yeah, that's that's it. You just kind of set it your you know, do your settings more or less to the light and to the conditions mm -hmm. and then you shoot as many as you can and hopefully one will <laughs> will be good and focus yeah. with the right uh, you know position and everything and that's going to be the yeah. good one and do you use manual focus or auto focus when you do events um it de it depends mostly i use a lot of auto focus because i don't i don't trust a lot of my eyes so i try to do but if i do manual i i learned how to how to do it with the help that the Digital cameras have? Sure. Oh, like PK? I, I suppose I'm not sure what's the technical name. Either the little red dots that come up. The, the, yeah, yes, yeah, the yeah, red peaking, dots. Yeah. The red dots, that's super helpful. So I've been able to focus more or to be sure, like at least the eyes are on focus. Mm -hmm. cool. So that's pretty helpful. Sometimes with uh, dance or with day photography, you can do that. But most of the time, you just set it like. To, to put it automatic and, and to call for the best. Yeah. yeah. Spray and pray. So I think if you're doing it for yourself, what I've learned is that you got to put the FOMO mm -hmm. on the side. Yeah. And you'd be surprised that what you can do with like limited gear, right? For like that figure skating event yeah. you went to, I brought a rangefinder with me, no autofocus, and we we're taking photos of figure skaters. So I ended up essentially setting the focus based on the scale of my lens and waiting for the figure skaters to come within the range and then hope, hoping that when I click the shutter, they're about, you know, they're about where they should be. And it actually worked. Like it worked better than I, better than I thought because um, I was trying to keep up with them using manual focus. It was hopeless. Um, and then when I changed, um, like changed it up, and, and wait it for them to come into the frame. It, it actually worked a lot better. And, and a lot of times when I travel, because I, I pack light um, and I would just take uh, 50 with me and just go wherever. Um, I think as long as you get over the fact that you won't get every single shot you want and that's completely okay. It's not, it's just a picture. It's not that big of a deal. Um, I think that I, that's actually more freeing because I, I oh, my problem is before, like I, I guess this last, because I guess I got into photography in, in in phases, right? Like the first phase I already told you about, like I didn't even know what photography was. I just had a camera. I was taking pictures of buses. <laughs> uh, and then the second phase was, you know, you know those point and shoot cameras when I was in high school. So that was the early two thousands. 
everybody com- came up like the competition was who can come up with the smallest thinnest l- lightest point and shoot cameras yeah, right because everybody's got one in there like super thin it's like a yeah. business card almost so that was why i, I had a camera i, I like taking photos but i was more into the technology yeah the the consumer electronics side of it again i didn't know nothing about photography you didn't need to know anything about photography because yeah. the camera is about how small and how light and how thin it was um and then i think after university i got my first slr dslr was canon okay um at the time i remember i bought a zoom lens it was like 18 to 200 everybody had an 18 to 200 at some point mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's basically, hey, I, I got, you know, I got a great camera, I got a DSLR, look at me, right? I got this lens, and I just, and today I look back, like, well, most of these pictures are crap. <laughs> oh. But uh, but again, like, I was more into, I think the fact that the cameras did so much for me probably was detrimental because I did not even bother. Cause, cause now they thinking back, right? When you finally understand kind of the, you know, like, how ISO shutter speed and aperture interact with each other it's really not that difficult of a concept to grasp Mm -hmm. but when the camera is doing it for you for some reason it just it's just so hard to drive it into your head Mm -hmm. what everything is doing but even today like you know you can still be forgetting you know you take the camera out you start clicking and then all of a sudden you notice something's not on the right setting yeah exactly and especially yeah so but so that was kind of so it wasn't and the reason i'm kind of a like i'm very self-conscious whenever i'm taking photos in the big group because i'm slow and all my stuff is like super slow and i spent like way more money than everybody else on this slow gear that doesn't really do a lot but that's really because that's what taught me photography so i i got into like i think i really started understanding what photography is when I so I did my master's in Germany I lived there for two years um, and I, I worked for six years before I went to went and did my master's so it was super stressful the first semester um, the first semester you did like courses and stuff right you I, I understood the the terms the words it's like you're sitting in class and the prof is like blabbering on about stuff and you're like I've heard about I've heard of these things before but I cannot for the life of me recall like how to do anything right it's the first semester exam period super stressed out um so to me like therapy was watching uh, uh youtube videos on photography i remember i was like salivating um over this uh the olympus pen f remember that mm. little camera it's yep. like beautiful it's gorgeous it's a rangefinder style camera that's completely digital micro four thirds uh, it doesn't actually have a rangefinder but it, it looks like one of the old cameras it's gorgeous and then i was and then i discovered this brand well i mean i knew about leica because i i had a cousin who's into photography and she brought it up before and she's always had a lumix because lumix and leica always had a they always had a partnership of some sort yeah so i started looking at these you know leica m then i started you know watching videos on leica m i was like oh holy crap this is like awesome and then i looked at the price tag and i almost cried (laughs) yeah 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 so but like i guess fast forward a, a, a few months in germany um so so to me photography is kind of literally what kept me sane mm-hmm. and and i actually managed to finish my master thesis early so instead of like doing it in two years it kind of did in like a year and 18 eight months. months or something like 18 months because i had like a few months where i'm just like doing nothing in germany like it was just an extended vacation mm-hmm. um and I was pretty much set on because I finished my thesis and I was pretty set on buying myself a nice present um, to kind of convince myself. I bought a lens. I bought an M mount lens that's from uh, Voigtlander or Folklander. Even before I had the camera, right? Just so okay, I bought this lens. I gotta buy the camera, right? <laughs> and then the good friend of mine who got married last year, and and she's dragging me. You know, she wants to go on a road trip. She's like, hey, you let's go on a road trip. I'm, uh, and she's like, oh, don't you wanna? Why don't we go to Vetslar? Like you keep talking about this place. I'm like, probably not a good idea. Well, no, we'll go to Vetslar. So next thing we got in the car, we went to Vetslar, and I I went prepared. I had two credit cards, so I could split the camera on. And luckily, I got there. Well, the, so Vetslar is where the Leica factory is. Mm-hmm. If you if you haven't heard it before, they they built it into. So the building looks like two lenses connected together. Okay. It's very interesting. Yeah, Lights Park. Um, so there's a museum in there. 
There's the store, there's the factory, you can kind of, but it, it was a Friday afternoon we got there. So like not a lot of stuff going on in the factory and I was pretty much the only person in the store. And there, like everything you could ever want from Leica and they will let you play with it for like hours on end. I was there like playing with a Leica M for like good hour and a half. And I, I just couldn't leave without one. <laughs> so, and luckily they had a demo unit there um, so demo units are 10% off. So mm -hmm. instead of, uh, so I got the entry level Leica M at the, um, it was actually, so the M10 already came out at the time. So the generation before that was the M240 and then they had an entry level model that's made of aluminum inside of brass called the M type 262. What's even better about the 262 though, is that the, the 262 is literally a film Leica M, but digital. What I mean is, it, so the M240 actually had live view. If you wanted to shoot it like a digital camera, you could. If you don't want to use the rangefinder, you could. The M260, they stripped everything out of it. There's no live view. You can. There's no interface for an EVF because you can buy an external EVF for the other like M's. You either shoot with the uh, you either shoot with the rangefinder or you didn't take photos. So that's kind of what taught me this camera. Like I have it in my hand right now for the people who can't see. Um, it literally taught me everything about photography because there's no shortcuts. You can't you can't look at stuff right. The lenses are completely manual. There's manual focus. Um, you can set a, um, you can set aperture priority by setting it to auto um, auto shutter speed and auto ISO. But you still have to you still have to do half at least you have to do at least half the work manually and then mm -hmm. the other half if you know what you're doing you can kind of automate it a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But anyway, so. Well, I guess I went on a tangent. Anyway, so the camera, it was 10% off. So for like a student, it was, I think it was, instead of 5,500 euros, VAT included, it was 4,950 euros. Wow. Yeah. I, I bought it. <laughs> and it was the best thing. It was the best thing ever. I never regretted it. I, I bought a second M and again, like I just, I don't, it's one of not one of those things I regret. I don't have kids. I don't ever think of having kids. So you have a cat. I have a cat. Cats are cheap. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're low maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Plus they, they can double as models. Yeah. So uh, to me, that's really how I got into it. Like this time around is through doing it manually and um, I guess just doing it by hand. Right. Um, so for the, I think I had like almost three months free after I got the camera in Germany. Every other day I was out taking photos. So it was like, I, I always refer to it as the best time in my life because that's what I meant. I got, I got the like I am and I was going all over the place taking all kinds of photos. So mm -hmm. it, it's been a lot of fun. It's yeah. like a mini vacation plus you're learning, exactly. yeah. learning the new gear. Yeah. So if you had the money, all the money in the world, which camera would you buy now? Oh, uh, I already have it, I think. Yeah. Like you're sticking with the, what you have. Yeah. yeah, I have. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I recently just bought M10. I bought a used M10 monochrome. Um, it's a 40 megapixel digital M that only takes black and white photos. Right. Yeah, so I would, I can't, I can't really think of another camera I would want, want to shoot with unless it's for, like, unless I'm doing it for someone else. Like, if I, you know, my friends would ask me to take some photos just to speed up the process, I probably use my Lumix, it's an S5, but mm -hmm. um, but otherwise I, I, I use the Leica every time. I think it, it much depends on what your, what your pictures are for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you are shooting for a gallery, for printing for yeah. a gallery, or if you are shooting for advertisement, or if you are shooting for yourself, mm -hmm. it, it like the kind of equipment you choose depends yeah. a lot on a, a lot of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. But they say gear doesn't matter as much, but I think it does in a way. It yeah. limits you to certain things. It limits yeah. You. Yeah. Yes. It, yeah. It limits you, but at the same time, sometimes we end up. <laughs> we like gear, right? We like we like cameras and yeah. lenses, mm -hmm. and sometimes we end up with uh, a lot fancier stuff that we yeah. actually need. Yeah. To right because we like it. Like I mean. It's, yeah. And sometimes you don't know until you try it and you're like, oh my god, now I know why people are raving about it because it's yeah, like five thousand yeah. dollars, but this lens is amazing. Like, yeah. It feels so powerful in my hands. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the gear does matter. So, like, you, you definitely, knowing what to do matters the most, but the gear, yeah. but you also start realizing, what, like certain photos I just wouldn't even, 
like I would try with the Leica M, but I wouldn't have any expectation of any results just because when you're, you know, like your Sony, for example, it'll track everybody's eyes. It'll do so much, right? Like if, <laughs> if I was at a sporting venue, I'll probably just set the scale and hopefully someone would come, yeah. right? Like someone would walk yeah. into that and hope for the best, right? Whereas, you know, someone with a more advanced camera can literally like yeah. try yeah. to, yeah. yeah. But again, that's one of the reasons why I chose the A7 IV because I mostly do portraits. Mm -hmm. So the A7 IV has eye tracking, yeah. continuous shooting, mm -hmm. again, it's digital, so I don't have to worry about wasting film. It is expensive, yes. Do I regret it? Absolutely not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the lenses, the first lens that I chose to go with was the 85 1.4 because I mostly do portraits and I do portraits outdoors. Yeah. And 1.4 mm -hmm. is really good because in mm -hmm. low light conditions, yeah. yes, when I do portraits, I want the focus to be on the model's eye. Yeah. But again, I would also be, it's a fast camera yeah. and I'll also be getting more light into it. So I don't have to worry too much. Yeah. So on my T7i, that was an APS-C. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would already get lower light. That was a DSLR. And this is a mirrorless full frame. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot yeah. more advantages to it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but again, speaking of the different styles of shoot, mm -hmm. I do portraits. I'm way more comfortable with portraits. I do boudoir. I do a little bit of risque stuff. Uh, it's been a while since I did any street or landscape because I have a 35 1.8, and it's been a while since I did landscape. Uh, sorry, street photography. The last time I did was uh, when I'm the first time I met you at mm -hmm. the Chinese Lantern Festival. So that was back in October ish. Yeah, around September like 2022. Fall. Yeah, yeah, it was around that time. Uh, so it's been a while since I did that. I personally find, even though I do portraits, when I go for street, I prefer to have people in it. Mm. But that's mostly because I like taking photos of people. Right. When it comes to landscape or architecture, I can do architecture because I was a civil engineer back in India. Mm -hmm. So I do have a general understanding of the buildings mm -hmm. and also a basic understanding of photography. So that's easier for me. When it comes to landscape, I struggle so much. Okay. Mm. So that's something that I want to no improve. There's yeah, again, mm. there's no people, but also it takes me quite a bit of time to see what exactly I want to shoot to right. purpose the image in my head. When I do people, I say, okay, this is gonna be in the background, but the background's gonna be blurred. Yeah. Is the background gonna to add to the subject? So mm -hmm. I concentrate more on the subject. But with the landscape, yeah. the landscape itself becomes the subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I think I think it's, it 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 goes back to that mental image I was talking about, right? So for example, for me, it's just the opposite. I see a landscape and I can picture it perfectly in in a photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, I can picture it in, yeah, yeah, in a, in a photograph, in a print, and in a. But when I see people, I honestly don't know what to do with people. <laughs> honestly, I, I don't. I, I honestly don't, don't know. Like, yeah, it's, they are there, but then what? They're just standing there. It, it's it's like what 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 should I do? Should I smile or no? Look at the camera or no? Like. I don't have that mental image in my head mm -hmm. to guide me to take a portrait. You see, I would argue mm -hmm. that taking portraits is way easier because you can direct the subject, you can do <laughs> stuff, you can change the angle yourself. But if the landscape, let's say you're shooting a mountain, the mountain's there, what are you going to do with the mountains? <laughs> just <laughs> see, just take a picture of the yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it, it's, it's true that well, you still can do a lot of things because you can have a frame, for example, naturally framed with trees or you could add, like, yes, that's true. You cannot direct a mountain, for sure. That would be fun. <laughs> but, but still to direct people, again, you need to have a starting point in your mm -hmm. head. And then go from there. I think they're different skill sets. Too. Yeah, I think I think the creativity also, like how it kind of shines through, is a little different too, right? Like for portraits, you can yeah, you can definitely set it up more yourself, right? For landscape, you're basically at the mercy of the weather and everything else. Um, just think about like for example, just think about you know a picture of Lake Louise, right? How like how many millions of photos do we have um, on Instagram of Lake Louise? So to to stand out. To, to have to take a photo that everybody else on earth has basically taken but have a stand out you, you basically have to really get creative on how you know what time you go to 
the lake to you know, what conditions you might or might not get right because you don't you can kind of plan for it but it doesn't really no. work out you know just because you try to plan for it um there are tools you can use now to try to plan for you know landscape shoes yeah. but at the same time um it's it's you, you you have to have some sense of you know how different or how unique the shot has to be in order you know so people that's why people like you know walk overnight to lake o'hara is o'hara yeah no not sorry not a moran you know because again that's again that's another spot that you know, everybody in the docks taking a photo of so you have to basically go during you know golden hour or some kind of you know different weather condition because nowadays it's like these popular spots a nice sunny day with blue you know blue sky and like some clouds that's like the most boring photo you can ever take just because everybody with the phone can take that same photo yep. um and that's, a, that's, a, that's the thing with landscape yeah right? that's a, it's already beautiful it, yeah 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 that, that's the thing with landscape right that uh for for the famous landscape photographers they spend i don't know probably 80 90 percent of their time uh, finding the location and setting it and getting to the location and finding a place that no one else yeah. has access to. Well, for example, for me, working with models, yeah. it's been new. Yeah, same here. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm normally, I or um, I was normally, you know, either I travel or just go out the street with my camera and yeah. take pictures of the things I see. Like, um, yeah, for me, up to this point, photography has been mostly a alone journey, more than a social one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That includes models. Yeah. So, yeah. If you haven't noticed, during the model shoot, I was basically like following you around because you really knew what you were doing <laughs> and I didn't. I was just like, oh, whatever Steve says, so just, just do that and I'll take photos. <laughs> Again, that's that's another thing. So I've, I've worked with models before, but I haven't worked with a group of photographers. So uh -huh. Ian has done a uh, portrait before. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there was another person who also Joe. wrote it. But Joe also yeah. has done portraits before. So I I was I was more conscious about not getting into their way, okay. not getting in their way yeah. of having the shoot, mm -hmm. and also trying to adjust because again, uh, Ian had bought lights with him mm. yeah and joe also knew what he was doing mm -hmm. so with me i was just making sure as can, can, can i go now is, is this model free now is this yeah. place free now yeah <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so i was just making sure of that and as uh, I, I actually could have done a bit more but again this was a group photo shoot so there's mm -hmm. a little bit of give and take in there yeah uh i felt the same way when we had the landscape shoot okay mm -hmm. so you guys clearly knew what we were going i was like okay i i, I used to do this back in 2020 what do i remember this that was three years ago mm -hmm. did i did i get anything did i get mm -hmm. no <laughs> i was coming up empty but when i was back in ottawa when i did the street photo shoots when i did landscape when i did architecture yeah. mm -hmm. i post so that was on a different account so the uh, ufo boy account that i have now that's mostly for portraits uh -huh. uh, that's only for portraits yeah. Yeah. Um, I have another account where I do burning landscape and everything. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing photography in that, I was tagging, uh, you know, the shout out pages on Instagram mm -hmm. and they constantly give me shout outs. Hey, this person posted this. I was yeah. like, Hey, thank you. And mm -hmm. that was like three years again. After three years, I lost so much of what I used to do mm -hmm. in landscape and everything. So that was a little bit disappointing because I was like, uh, yes, of, uh, I mean, I believe that a photographer should have a forte in mm. one specific genre, so mine is portraits, mm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that I should completely abandon the other styles. Mm. So I was yeah. like, okay, I, I have to do this, I have to get back into landscape. Jesus Christ, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> and I'm ruining sensors. So. so I think we're going to wrap it up because or... we've been going quite a while. We can go on tangents forever. It's really fun. I just want to thank you guys for coming. Mm -hmm. It's so great to talk with you and sharing your heart, your mm -hmm. emotions and your experiences with photography. Um, thanks, for, thanks for taking time to come here as well. And um, is there anything you want to say before we wrap it up? 
I hope you found this interesting. And if you came, and if you lasted this long, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for for having us, for inviting us. Mm-hmm. Not what thank you for people who are listening. Um, also, hopefully we have entertained you for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for having us. Um, I guess there's a photographer that I really like. Um, his name is Torsten uh, Overgaard. And he always says, always wear a camera. I try to do that more, and I think that's something that people should, uh, should do. Always wear a camera. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you all. And, um, well, look forward to shooting more with you guys in the future for photo Definitely. walks and doing more studio shoots and just getting to know you as like yes. friends on a deeper level. I'm learning from each other, I think. Yeah. yeah. The greatest. Mm-hmm. It's a learning yeah. experience. Greatest, yeah. Yeah. And I hope you guys had a good time and learned something new. Absolutely. <laughs> and add to this ever building toolbox of skills that you have already. So thank you very much. Thank Stay you. colorful, everyone. And let's say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I just want to thank Luna, Yi, and Steven for joining me again. It was a pleasure having them on the podcast. And of course, you guys, the audience, for listening. I want to thank you all. Till the next one. Bye.